because Justin Petkus. Uh, sales leadership is something that some of you are going, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a rep or whatever. You're going to be thrown into the fire at some point. You need some of this advanced knowledge. You never know when that's going to happen. Oh, advanced knowledge. This is knowledge. here to help he's you. Me, he's setting me up right here. Right. Justin Petkus. All right, thank you. How's everybody doing this morning? Good, good, good. All right, so how many uh, folks do I have that are currently in leadership roles in the room? Raise your hands, please. Okay, so we're kind of heavy on this side. And then, obviously, how many are aspiring sales leaders? How many hope to be in a leadership role in the next handful of years? Okay, good. Um, so, I, I, when given the opportunity and platform to speak to all of you, obviously, I, I appreciate your attention early at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, but I, I had an opportunity to talk about a really cool and unique topic, also one that is dramatically changing in our industry. Uh, and really there's a trend that we're starting to see uh, that is becoming a challenge for all of us in leadership roles. And for those of you that are in the workforce now, you are part of this, this challenge that we're all looking to solve. But eventually you'll be hiring, training, recruiting, and and growing uh, the people with the same type of mindset. And I think what the challenge is, is that the evolution of the employer and employee relationship is, is changing dramatically. And this is causing us to have a shift in the way that we recruit, in the way that we train, in the way that we maintain our very best talent. And so it's really started to become more of an employee's market uh, versus an employer's market. Employees are demanding things that are different than what they may have been in the past. The I've got a job in sports uh, is not really that relevant anymore. And we have these companies, especially this is even more relevant here in the Bay Area, like the Googles and the Apples of the world that are really pushing us to try and create a different type of leadership that can hone the skills and development of our people because we can't hang with the financial compensation of some of those teams. We obviously have much more demands in terms of the hours and the rigors that our jobs may cause. Uh, it's not hanging out in sleeping cubes and drinking draft beer at your office all the time. It's, it's a different type of job, but at the same time, we get to walk across a field or a court or whatever, whatever it may be each day. And so this challenge really prompted us in the MBA to kind of raise our hands up in arms to, to leadership and say, how the heck can we figure out how to manage this millennial group, how to manage this group that's pushing us and asking us for different things when it comes to leadership. And so the NBA uh, took charge and they actually put out a survey called the Sales DNA Survey. Anybody ever heard of it? The non-NBA folks, nobody? So we sent it out to about 1,400 sales reps across all 60 NBA properties. And what it looked to do, the goal of it, was to find out what are those intrinsic qualities that separate our top performers uh, versus maybe our mid-level performers, and what are they looking for to get out of their leaders to get them ultimately to the next level. And what we saw from the results was staggering. We saw that the top 20% of people versus our bottom 80% of people essentially, they were craving skill development. That was the number one thing that stuck out to them was skill development, which also tells us they're not getting enough from us as leaders. They're not getting the attention they need that will ultimately develop their skills to get them to the next outlier, which was career growth. And now, they may be growing their careers, but maybe not at the accelerated rate at which they would like to grow their careers. Um, now there's so much information out there and so many people manning companies at such a young age that I think at times we can get out in front of ourselves and sometimes not be fully prepared for those types of roles. And that's on us as leaders to prepare our people. And the third uh, was a sense of belonging. A part of being a part of something bigger than all of us as individuals. And so while this survey, I think, validated some of the things that we thought were true, it really brought to the forefront that we need to change the way that we are leading our people. We need to change the way that we are listening and spending time with our people to make sure that we are hitting on these key indicators that separate our top people that we're maintaining our top talent. Because the struggle at times in this industry, or any industry for that matter, is there's a lot of time and resources that go into not only recruiting your best talent, but then training your best talent, but then most importantly, maintaining your best talent to create that bench strength for you so that you're not constantly having to go through the recruiting cycle. And so we are really faced with a challenge when we look at, at this survey 
And it really is prompting us to change to more of a, a servant leadership type attitude where we must understand that we are there to serve our people, not necessarily just to be the masters of process and lay something out for our people to follow. I think gone are the days where employees, and I'm hoping I get some head nods here, say, what can I do for you? It's more of a, what can you do for me? type of attitude. And I can remember actually interviewing with this gentleman right here, Paul Epstein, uh, way back when. I would have killed to have a job in sports. I think the line I gave you was, I'll stamp your freaking mail if you give me this job to, to work here at the Clippers, right? I, I was so like excited to even have an opportunity to interview. And it's crazy to see how much that shifted just in the last 10 years that I've been in the industry where I, you can talk to any rep and they've got 10 offers from 10 teams. They went to the number one sport management uh, major in the country. They've got their MBA. They've got 15 internships. It's just crazy how challenging it is out there. And kudos to all of you that are on the rep side for doing those things and pushing to challenge us to, to innovate our process. And I think as I thought through who are the best innovators of this process and who is getting out in front of this trend and absolutely dominating, and it comes actually from the college basketball ranks. I'm curious, who's, who's a college basketball fan in here? Any? Okay. What about University of Kentucky fans? Okay, I figured out. Okay, we got one. All right. Uh, uh, we got two. Okay, all right. There we go. So, uh, Coach Calipari, uh, where are we going here? Let's, there we go. Coach Calipari is a perfect example of someone who is absolutely bucking the trend. He may not be the best X's and O's coach in the world. There's hundreds of those coaches who may be able to diagram, diagram better X's and O's or a better game plan, but Coach Calipari has cornered a market. And it kind of lines up with what we're seeing even in our own employees. There's the skill development piece, right? There's the preparation for the next level, the accelerated career growth. He gets knocked for having tons of one and dones, but at the end of the day, they're in the final four, they're in the championship conversations, and they're a relevant program every single season since he has been there. And he's done this through a, a player's first approach. He actually, his book called Players First really talks about his mantra of focusing on his people and committing time and energy to their success first, even over the programs at times. And what does that say to his players? That says that I ultimately know that if I sacrifice my time and my energy toward your individual success, if I focus on the name on the front, and the back of the jer on the front of the jersey as well as the back of the jersey, and you get to the NBA, ultimately I know that's going to breed success for me and for the program. You're going to feel like a part of something bigger than yourself. And it's crazy, he gets players that are essentially the big fish in whatever school they were at before for at least four plus years, and they come to his team and they're just a part of the machine. He gets his players bought in in the we not I mentality and that none of us is as smart as all of us. And he does a great job there. So, what can we learn from Coach Calipari's servant leadership approach and his commitment to the front of the jersey and the back, and also what we learn from sales DNA and, and turn that into our own business and make sure that we're stepping up and meeting the demands uh, of the workforce? Uh, and I think it's through three key principles. I think first is that servant leadership philosophy. I'm curious, anybody in here know what servant leadership is? Anybody heard of servant leadership that can share? Yes. Yeah. What it means, well, yeah. To me, it means putting your staff first. Okay. Great. Great. What else? Anything else? Nobody. I, I completely agree. I think that it's not just saying it, but doing it. And not just doing it, but showing your employees from your number one rep all the way down to maybe the rep who's struggling that you are invested in their success, both in the short term and long term. But what does it take in order for us as managers to make sure that we're showing them that commitment, that we are serving our people? What's the biggest thing that that takes away from us? What was that? Time, right? Time, the most important thing, right? We run our entire day by time. And a lot of times when we have our top performers, how many managers in this room can admit, and I'm one of them, that when you have your top performers, at times you tend to just leave them alone, let them do their thing. Right? Anybody? Raise their hand. No? Don't leave me alone up here. All right. Uh, it happens, right? And sometimes with the folks that maybe aren't showing us that same push, the folks that aren't showing that same insatiable drive to get there, how many times do maybe they get left behind? 
right? Like, let's, let's be honest with each other here, right? So I think at times it's finding that commitment to spending time with our people. And this goes both ways because it's also the preparation and the commitment by the rep to manage up as well. So for all of you here in this room, it's so important that you don't just let your results speak, speak for themselves. Come tell us. Tell us all the things that we're not seeing on a day in and day out basis while we're sitting there running all our analytics reports and thinking that's the whole story, right? So literally a commitment to organizing your day around your employees. How many managers in here can honestly say that they organize their day around the time that they invest with their employees versus anything else? How many? Not a lot, right? Not a lot. And you could make the argument that in theory, if we spend more time with our employees, serving our employees, helping them develop the things that they're pointing out to us, skill development, career growth, being part of something bigger. You could argue that if we invested most of our time there versus where we tend to invest our time, which is reporting, analytics, meetings, to set more meetings, all of these things, then in theory, doesn't that mean that if our people are all getting better, they're all bought in and committed to the organization, both in the short and long term, that we should be able to drive better results? Because at the end of the day, like, it's a results-based business. We all have a fiduciary responsibility to the company. right? And in order for us to keep our best people, we have to be able to meet their needs. It is the employee-based based economy. And then finally is transparency. Why is transparency up there? What, what do I mean by that? Who can, who can chime in on that? What do I mean by transparency between rep and manager? Anybody? Yes? You know where you stand. You know where you stand. Now, why would that be important? Absolutely, right? So if you're craving skill development, if you are craving a sense of belonging, no better way to understand where you fit in that whole thing than understanding where you're at. And it's not necessarily just the numbers on the board. It's not necessarily just the numbers on the board. What are the other things that your manager maybe has pointed out to you that might be important to your long-term success? What else outside of your numbers? Anybody? Attitude, right? Attitude is great. What do you mean by attitude? Where are we at? I don't know where that came from. Okay, got it. We know that sales is a bit cyclical, right? It's a little bit up and down, a bit of a roller coaster. And so if we know you're bringing that attitude piece, right, along with the results, we know that this is not rocket science what we do. If you bring the attitude and you bring the effort every single day, we'll provide you with the tools and skills needed to go out and produce the results, right? It's, it's as simple as that at times. Okay, so my, in my opinion, what happened when I saw the change uh, in terms of what some of my thoughts and perceptions were from my team, I, I grew frustrated because I, I was out there putting together what I thought were rock solid game plans. I would get my team in a room, I'd run them through the game plan and I'd say, all right, go out there and get it. And find myself frustrated when the results weren't being met. And then my employees would come to me and have gripes about it, right? Or they'd have opinions on it that maybe necessarily I didn't ask for. And it started to make me realize even more how important the idea of being there for my people and, and coaching for the name on the front and the name on the back of the jersey, right? And making sure that I am organizing my day around prioritizing spending time and investing in my people. And sometimes that's as simple as leaving my door open all day. Sometimes that's as simple as carving out an hour and walking on the floor and making myself available. Sometimes it's not even spending time with my team, it's spending time with other teams so that that way that leadership can spread not only from maybe my five or seven people but to these other teams on the floor, right? And then everybody will start collaborating more. But what I, what I want to have a conversation with all of you about and maybe some of the managers could really step up here is talk about like what have you seen in the workforce and what adjustments have you made based on the things that we saw in the survey, based on the attitude maybe of some of your employees, and what adjustments have you been able to make uh, over the last, call it six to 12 months? Anybody want to step up and share? Or maybe they're not going, I'm just the only guy with these, uh, these issues, I guess. Yes, so, Paul. Um, just to share, we all hear the power of why. Why do we do what we do? And a big part of transparency that I've seen shift especially with millennials is it's more than just what's in front of them it's and more than why do you work for the company it's what is this leading to 
right? What does the light look like at the end of the tunnel? So the whole what's in it for me, not in a selfish perspective, but just in a grander fashion, skill development may be number one, but why am I looking to improve upon my skills? And, and so that's been a shift that not just at the 49ers, but in other places, we've really placed a lot of emphasis on it. So far, it's seen the ROI. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and it's very organic as well. Mm -hmm. Totally. And, and that's a great point, Paul, is that when I talk about the shift in the employee and employer relationship, it's not to say that you know, employees are selfish or they're self-fulfilling. It's more that you have so much access to information. Your social media, your LinkedIn, you're constantly seeing people growing and advancing in their careers and exposed to all of these different things. And you can't help but think, well, what about me? Right? And at some times, you, can feel, you feel that you can only go as far as the leadership around you. Right? So that is on us as leaders to not worry about the, the I, but worry about the we. To focus on committing our time to growing our people. Because I know, I know that the more successful my people are, the more successful my program is, and ultimately the more successful I will be. And if you look at the, the Coach Calipari example, there's not a lot of players out there that if they want to get to the NBA and they want to get there quick, who's the first person they're thinking of that they want to go play for? It's Coach Calipari. If they want to play four years, maybe they go play somewhere else, right? But because he committed so hard to that servant leadership approach and getting his players to buy in and sacrifice for the greater good of the we, it's now kind of turned the tables on him to where maybe now he doesn't have to spend as much time or struggle as much to recruit because his story is being told by what's happening with his players and with his program for him. I've seen the same shift with my team since I've started committing more time and more non-reschedules of one-on-ones, more consistent, calculated meetings with my reps. I've seen a dynamic shift in my team. And probably the biggest that sticks out to me is, is the culture shift the buy-in and all of them rooting for each other and not having the me and I mentality of what do I get, and it's more what do we get. Uh, I actually went to, to our VP a couple of months ago and stopped giving cash bonuses to my team because they requested that if we hit our goal, if everybody hits our goal in a month, we want team building activities. We want to go do things together. And that really like put me back in my chair thinking, you don't want cash? You don't want me to give you more money for hitting goals? Like, they wanted something that brought the team together that they could share and enjoy together. And if one person didn't hit it, they don't want it. And that really blew me away in terms of the type of mentality that, that our employees have. But I think that comes from that time commitment. So uh, I really do appreciate your time. I'm open to take any questions that you may have um, regarding this topic. But I, I do appreciate your attention uh, this early in the morning. So any questions out there at all? Yes. Very true. I like that. Very cool. Yes? So I, I think what, what I've seen is that when all of my employees feel that there's preferential treatment, I think, going to your top 20%, that's what's going to always cause them to have that resentment, right? And so for me, I've, I'm always a believer in people and a believer that no matter how much you struggle, uh, if given the time and given the energy, if, if you meet me halfway, we can get you to that next level. But ultimately, I, I can't want success more than you want it for yourself. And so I, I think it's more letting reps know that there is an outlet there and letting them know that there is a commitment from leadership to getting them all to the next level. And I think you do that, one, by your actions, two, by your transparency, uh, and I think three, by creating a culture of, of openness where you can have those conversations and, and they can be constructive versus, I guess, argumentative or, or, or kind of a, a downtrodden and, and negativity. So I think really that the separation is giving them all the tools and, and believing in them and coming from that servant leadership approach and trying to get your middle tier up or your lower tier up to your middle tier, your middle tier up to your superstar tier, and your superstars ultimately are, are going to end up going on to uh, 
you know, bigger and better things eventually, but I think it's keeping the cycle going. Yes? In my opinion, I, I, I would tend to focus most of my time, obviously to sit here and say like it's all even amongst everybody would be, I think, kind of a ridiculous thing to say because part of that is based on the rep, right? There's some reps that they just don't want a lot of the interaction. Now some of that's going to be forced anyways because I, I want to make sure I know what's going on, but at the same time there's some who appreciate their independence, right? So I can find a balance there, but I think what it comes down to is, is understanding what it is that motivates each of my people because this survey was done with 1,400 people. It doesn't factor in like the individuals on each team and this doesn't also lump everybody in that all of you on this side of the room, your number one most important thing to you is skill development. It's different for each and every person. So I think the first key is focusing time, understanding what is intrinsically important to each person as an individual and then it's constantly taking whatever time that is, whether it's 20%, 10%, 50% of my time and focusing on hitting those hot buttons to get them to that next level. I would say that, that for me, I usually will tend to spend most of my time with my core performers, which is kind of that middle group, to try and motivate those folks to get to that, that superstar level because I know that if I get one person to jump into that next stratosphere, it's gonna cover maybe the folks that end up not really loving sales or end up switching careers and it will help me if there's eventual turnover if I can create more people into, into that superstar category. That makes sense? Can I answer your question? Okay, what else? All right, well, thank you all so much for your time. I really do appreciate it this morning, and uh, let me know if I can help with anything. <laughs>